Welcome back to this series on neural network programming with PyTorch. In this video, we will look closely at the differences between the primary ways of transforming data into PyTorch tensors. By the end of this video, we will know the difference between the primary options as well as which options should be used and when. Without further ado, let's get started. PyTorch tensors, as we have seen, are instances of the torch.tensor PyTorch class. The difference between the abstract concept of a tensor and a PyTorch tensor is that PyTorch tensors give us a concrete implementation that we can work with in code. In the last video, we found that there are four primary ways to get a tensor instance in PyTorch. We have the tensor class constructor, the tensor factory function with the lowercase t, and two other factory functions, as tensor and from numpy. Let's dig in and uncover the differences between these methods. I'm here in a notebook now, and I've already got a few things set up. I've imported PyTorch and numpy, and I've already created some data with this numpy array. Let's create some tensors now with the four different options. The first and second pieces of code are strikingly similar. The only difference with these two pieces of code is the casing of the letter T in the method name. The first way with the uppercase T is the class constructor, and the second way with the lowercase T is what we call a factory function. We can think of a factory function as a function that accepts parameter inputs and returns a particular type of object, in this case, tensor objects. Factory functions are an object-oriented programming concept for creating objects. Instead of using a constructor to create a class instance, we can use a factory function that returns the object instead. The purpose of factory functions is to allow for more dynamic object creation. So the function with the lowercase t is indeed a factory function, and in fact, the other two functions as tensor and from numpy are also factory functions. So we can say that we have three factories and one constructor. All of the factory functions have better documentation and have more configuration parameters. So for now, we'll lean in the direction of preferring the factory functions over the constructor. Let's check the string representations of these tensors now and inspect their D types. Like we saw in the last video, the visual differences in this output are in the data types. This difference occurs because the constructor uses the global default dtype value when constructing a tensor while the factory functions infer the data type. We can verify that this global default value for the dtype is indeed float32 by using the get default dtype method. And indeed, we see that float32 is the default dtype. The factory functions, on the other hand, choose a dtype based on the incoming data. This is called type inference. The dtype is inferred based on the incoming data. In the first example, we have ints going in and ints coming out. And in the second example, we have floats going in and floats coming out. So this shows how type inference is working. The data type can also be explicitly set as well. In this example, our tensors D type is float64, even though we passed ints. All of the factory functions allow us to explicitly set the dtype like this. However, the constructor does not have this functionality. So this is an example of the constructor lacking in configuration options. This covers what we have been able to visually detect in terms of differences between these just by inspecting the output. Let's look a little deeper at a difference that is important and lurking behind the scenes. We'll go ahead and reinitialize our data and our tensors. Now we'll leave our tensors alone, but we'll modify the numpy array called data that we used as input when we created our tensors. So 
So we've modified the values in the array by setting them all to zero. The key point here though, is that we did not modify our tensors. Keep this in mind and let's inspect our tensors now. Hmm, something is up here. Pause the video if you want and see if you can determine for yourself what has happened here. The first two tensors, T1 and T2, contain the original data values from the input array. Changing the array after the fact did not affect the tensor data. The second two tensors, however, contain the same data that's now in the array after the change. The tensors T3 and T4 mirror the array, so to speak. This difference is caused by how memory is allocated within each of these creation options. The first two options create an additional copy of the input data in memory, while the second two share data in memory with the NumPy array. So the difference here lurking behind the scenes has to do with sharing of memory for performance. This table shows the breakdown. This is one of those features that makes PyTorch interoperable with NumPy. So if, you, if you're a NumPy user, uh, or if you generally use the Python data science ecosystem, uh, it's very seamless to go back and forth. Moving between NumPy arrays and PyTorch tensors can be very fast because the data is shared and not copied behind the scenes when creating new PyTorch tensors. If you want to convert a PyTorch tensor to NumPy array and vice versa, it's pretty seamless and also it is uh, very efficient because we, what we, we what we do at the back end is if you convert a NumPy array to a PyTorch tensor, we keep the same memory pointer between both of them. So it's a zero memory copy operation and it's typically almost free in practice. This of course depends on which method we use for the creation of the tensor. When we say that a PyTorch tensor shares memory with a NumPy array, we just mean that the actual data in memory exists in a single place. As a result, any changes that occur in the underlying data will be reflected in both objects, the array and the tensor. Like the consequence of keeping the data pointer to be the same between PyTorch and NumPy is that if you change the PyTorch tensor, the NumPy, NumPy array automatically changes and vice versa. Sharing data is more efficient and uses less memory than copying data because the data is not written to two locations in memory, only one. So this establishes that the as tensor call and the from NumPy call both share memory with their input data. So this brings us to the question that everyone wants to know, which of these should we use? Let's discuss the best options now and then we'll cover some gotchas to watch out for. The best option is going to be the tensor factory function with the lowercase t. This function is the go-to option for everyday use. Now there is a second option that we want to use if we are tuning our code for performance, and this is going to be the memory sharing as tensor factory function. Why this one though over the from numpy function? Well, the reason is simple. The as tensor function can accept any array-like Python data structure, while the from numpy call only accepts numpy arrays. Other than that, either one of those will work just fine. If we are just starting out writing some code from scratch, it's often a good idea to avoid putting a strong emphasis on performance, and instead focus on writing code that's readable and correct. Once this is achieved, we can review our code for performance issues and tune any problem spots or bottlenecks. The idea is that we don't want performance to be the reason that our code is incorrect or unnecessarily complex and hard to debug. Oh, see, that makes sense. On the blog post for this video on deeplizzard.com, I have a list of four things to keep in mind when using the memory sharing factory functions. Be sure to check that out and use it to check your understanding of these concepts. At this point, we should now have a better understanding of the PyTorch creation options. We've learned about factory functions and we've seen how memory sharing versus copying can impact performance and program behavior. Remember the blog post for this video on deeplizzard.com and be sure to check out the Deep Lizard Hive Mind where you can get exclusive perks and rewards. Thank you for contributing to Collective Intelligence by watching and sharing this video. I'll see you in the next one. We are living during the most extraordinary time ever in human history. And during our lifetime, during our lifetime that we're about to see the transformation of the human race. Truly something that 
blows my mind every time I think about it. And the conversation I keep having with my colleagues, my friends, my investors, my community in Silicon Valley goes something like this. People have no idea how fast the world is changing. We get frightened about grand challenges because we see them from far away, but guess what? The tools and technologies we have to solve these grand challenges is exploding onto the scene. That gives me the greatest hope for the future. AI is our most important tool ever to solve our grand challenges.